Welcome back to the Compound Podcast. This is episode 192, the second annual Compound Live. We have a great list of guests, some of the boys coming on live recording at Cubs Convention. This episode is brought to you by Connect Roasters. Connect Roasters, the coffee company that I've been involved with since 2020, started actually at the Compound connectroasters.com you can try their coffees we have a monthly subscription called the home run club you get to choose your coffee you get rewards there's plenty of perks including free shipping there's 11 different coffees to choose from connectroasters.com go check that out today we have nico and dansby coming on first and then albert alizé and justin Steele. Then Benny Zoe and I had a nice conversation to finish it up. So we will get to the Compound Live with Nico Horner and Dansby Swanson now. Welcome back to the Compound Podcast. This is the second annual Compound Live. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We're starting with Nico and Dansby. We've got the middle infield combo. Dans? Yep. Thank you. Dans, I just got to ask you, we're going to start. Last night we went cowboy hat, cowboy boots. Tonight we got the Jays and the hoodie. You're versatile, huh? <laughs> Do it all, coach. Do it all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just really feeling the hat last night. Um, Mallory was asking me if I was sure, and I said, so you're a confidence, baby. So I- just going to roll with it, and I loved it. I'm going to be honest. I really did. I got to tell you, I love a good hat. That must have been hard to travel with, though. I carried it through the airport. Yeah, I was like, can't put it in the oh, suitcase. In the yeah, no, no. It's, the security was not having it either. They were like, what are you doing with that? Yeah. I'm like, just, can, just scan it. I don't care what yeah. you do, but I need it. it for this outfit tonight. Yeah. So. There were some good outfits last night. You guys see the the boys? Quas with the Quas. red? I, I think Quas looked like the best. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Everybody see that? Jose Quas, the red coat. Yeah. It, it was like kind of Matrix, but... Like a little New York, New York sexy matrix. It's like, oh my god. So, I want to talk first about spring training last year. We get there, new middle infield combo. Talk about like what it was like because you played with Ozzy for so long, and Nick, you'd been on the other side of the infield. It played second with Hav, but then had been on the other side of the infield. So like getting to know each other, getting to know that position, the up the middle stuff. Yeah, I mean, people are definitely, we got the same question for about four straight months of, like, what it's like playing with each other, and yeah. you just don't really know until you actually do the thing. Yeah. So it's, spring training is helpful, but the actual season and the moments that matter, I think, is where the stuff really, really comes out, and I think it just got, like, simpler as, as the year went on, and still a lot to learn, obviously, but, um, yeah, the game itself is always going to be the biggest teacher. It is all about time, right? It's all about, like, you get those in-game experiences and figure out where each other plays. Like, it's awesome to watch you two guys go at it because, like, Dan's, you go into your backhand. It's like, oh, my God, get such a good view, Coach. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't, you don't have to worry about getting those. Like, I want to get those. Oh, my God. Um, no, I think it just, like you said, it takes time. And people, we want everything right now all the time. I mean, we hadn't even... We hadn't even practiced together, nor, like, taken a ground ball together. People are like, so what's it like playing with each other? Yeah, well, first, the yeah, first no double idea. play we ever turned was Marquee Network filming us doing double plays together, talking about how we <laughs> turn double plays together. Yeah. <laughs> so, <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. No, it was great. But it's, it, whether it's the two of us playing up the middle or us as a group, like, the season itself is always the teacher and is going to let you know. And, like, you know, you can look at last year as a whole – and go, you look at the r- lineups we were rolling out in April and May versus the end of the year, and it's like almost a, a different team in a lot of ways. So just keep heading in the right direction, and uh, yeah, the part's really fun. It is. It is always that way too. It's always <laughs> you get to spring, and it's like this is the team, and this is the lineup we're gonna roll out there. And then you get to August, it's like months. Well, Pretty different. Yeah. yeah. It's like this part of the off season, it's always like projections and predicting and this yeah. and that and like. No one has any idea what they're talking about, and I don't either, but like, no. we're just going to roll it out and go. It's, well, it's because it's fun. 
I mean, I do it with the Falcons coaching search all the time. I'm like, well, we're probably going to hire Bill Belichick, okay? Which means we're probably going to win three Super Bowls in the next five years. And it just doesn't work out the way that you always want it to or predict it to, and that's why you have to have depth. That's why you have to have good players. I mean, good players help you overcome a lot throughout the year, whether it's injuries or whether it's uh, you know tough times, the team's just not playing well or – the hitters are struggling, but the pitching's doing great. And then as soon as the hitting starts going good, the pitching seems to <laughs> yeah. go bad. So yeah. I've always been a fan of the more good players you have, the better your chance of success is. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about routine a little bit. Nico and I talked to the prospects a few days ago, and we were sloughing your routine because you're unbelievable. But the also, like, cleanest locker. It's unbelievable. Oh. You have like Me? four, yeah, four oh things God. in your locker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have awesome. the stuff. same glove for four years, one pair of cleats, you got a bat, you got some batting gloves, and you play baseball. He doesn't, nice. need any, he doesn't need any tools. He wears the same thing every day. You got the, it's all perfect. Yeah, that's a, that's a Vanderbilt thing. Corbs would like, if we ever had something that we left out, he would just take it. There was no like getting it back. It was just like just gone. gone forever. Yeah, like I remember someone had this workout shirt that they really loved, and they didn't have it hung up. It was just laying in their locker. Gone. Never seen again. <laughs> and you start yeah. doing that to Nicky Madge to get his yeah. stuff cleaned up. Well, and, and uh, I mean, honestly, it's kind of like, I mean, who makes their bed in the morning, right? I mean, my, I never used to, but my wife loves the bed made, so I now make the bed. And, yeah, yeah. I'm learning how to be a good husband, okay? Um, but it's the same kind of thing. Like, you want to be able to, at night when you go to bed, you want to have a, like a cleanly made bed. And it's the same thing with my locker. Like when I come into work, I want my locker to be clean and I know where everything is. Get a little rattled when things aren't where they're supposed to be. But, uh, yeah, no, I think, it's, I think there's a purpose behind it. But it reflects the routine in yeah. everything that you do. There's no clutter to your work. And I feel like for me, we've talked about this, but just like learning to kind of cut the fat off to where you have the essentials and things you believe in and roll that out and that takes a lot of confidence and time yeah and like what you can do to go play like that was one of the things you know dan's you coming over obviously you played every day for your whole career but definitely the last what was it 2020 on you you yeah, 2020 played, on 2020 on you had like missed a game and so it was like all right how does this guy go about his routine what does he do to get himself ready and just seeing the simplicity seeing the ability to go all right all i have to do today is do my hands work? I have to go hit in the cage right before the game, and like I'll be ready to go. Cause that and like learning. Can you talk a little bit about just like learning the day game schedule at Wrigley, like the difference between that? Yeah, I feel like that that was probably the biggest challenge for me this year was understanding the routine that had worked for me in the past doesn't necessarily equate to the routine working here. Just because you're pretty much guaranteed Friday, Saturday, Sunday being at one o'clock, and how I had always gone about it, I guess, like in depth wise, I'd always lifted every second day of the series like that was kind of my goal so it'd be two to three lifts a week and I would kind of do like first day would be full BP I'd do the full ground balls and everything the next day I would lift I wouldn't hit outside but I'd hit in the cage and I'd still do my hands work then the third day would usually be a day game kind of show and go well now that when you're in Chicago and you have a bunch of day games you can't just necessarily show and go every game because you'd pretty much be show and go in like half the season. Yeah, the whole season. Yeah, so I had to learn, okay, I have to lift on my getaway day at home because I'm not going to lift post-game to then get a shorter night of sleep to then play the next day. So just altering a few things and understanding how can I still get my work in to be a productive Major League Baseball player, but at the same time, how can I – uh get my rest and maximize the ability to play. And yeah, that's something yeah. that I know us three had talked a lot about was like, if it's going to take away from your ability to play that night, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And learning how to balance when it is and when it's not. So, yeah, I want, I want off season nuggets. I want what you're working on. Sneak <laughs> the bat speed. Can you talk about the bat speed? I love it so much. Uh, bat, I mean, bat speed's a hot topic right now. It's like a, People forever have wanted to, like most things people work on now, it's like been done in the game forever yep. and like you just talked about in a different way now. So how, how fast you swing the bat helps you hit the ball hard. Not any new knowledge, but. And, and well, in last year we both did bat speed. 
and so, trained so, it in the cage. I felt like I messed with some things, so I've taken it to the, the weight room. I'm swinging some, some sticks with different weights and doing some running guns, swinging fast. It's dude, pretty fun. They are awesome. <laughs> Righty and lefty, so feeling good. Last year we did, we both did bat speed training, and we had, like, different bat companies. Like, I had Louisville make me a set of weighted bats. So you go, like, lighter bats and then heavier bats and then your game bat, and you kind of swing. Like, the point would be the lighter bat, you swing it faster, you train your body to move fast, heavier bats, heavier. So we did all this stuff. And, like, it, some of it worked, some of it didn't work, but we did it all mostly hitting balls. And then you kind of manipulate your swing because you want to hit the ball well, and then you're not just, like, fully training on bat speed. So this offseason, Nico got, like, a – we got Danny Mueller, a clubhouse guy, uh, some speed sticks for golf because he wanted to get his driving distance up, which led to speed sticks for baseball. So Nico showed me videos of him doing, like, full-on – like a five step, like he's gonna, like he's gonna do. Like I'm gonna throw a javelin. Yeah, or like he's gonna throw a javelin, but then he swings a bat. <laughs> no, it, it, so it's good. been fun, and a lot of the uh, off season is just staying athletic and and moving fast. One of my takeaways is I actually swing faster left handed than right handed, which is kind of concerning, maybe. But we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> maybe if there's a low slot righty bad matchup this yeah, year. Yeah. Javi did it once. Yeah, it, Javi the, hit a double lefty in yeah. a major league game. Yeah, that was but awesome. it's, yeah, it's it's fun to have an off season where you get athletic and you learn. Like you keep you just keep learning stuff about yourself every year, which is the most fun part of it. Dan's, I saw some video of you. You're getting back in the cage. You're swinging it. Yep. Podcast guy. Podcast uh, guy. Podcast. Po- po- is it a podcast if it's visual, too? Say that again? Like, you have a, it's a YouTube thing. Yeah, it's kind of all the above, you know? Is it going to look like... Well, my best friends uh, really loves, like, photo- uh, photography, videography, producing content. Um, he, pretty much, he teaches at a high school, and so we kind of kind of convinced me to evolve my game a little bit when it came to content and doing podcast stuff so it's a really good way for us to just stay connected and yeah you know we were like we love talking about whether it's sports or uh having people on and just having like real conversations like why not just let's just like record them now you know and then just put it out there for other people to see so uh we're starting to do that and hopefully be able to continue it throughout the season um but yeah i've been back in the cage um you know just trying to dial some things in and i think the the toughest part in an off season for me is there's obviously a rabbit hole and you can go down a rabbit hole sure. and you know, you got this guy over here that believes in this one thing. And then you got this coach over here that believes in this one thing. And it's like, okay, if I dumb it down to the best version of myself, what does that look like? And how can I get back to being me? It's not necessarily about doing something, becoming something else. It's about yeah, it's becoming like wholesaling. It's about, yeah, it's about becoming what makes me the best player I can be. So uh, and that takes a little bit of time. It really does because you kind of go into it with a certain plan and then you realize that I'm going to be 30 next month, you know, <laughs> like doesn't work like that anymore. Um, and so just trying to evolve, obviously, my game and, uh, you know, continue to get better. So I've always felt like in the off season, I've had times in my career where I've tried to do wholesale stuff, I've tried to like change. No, I'm, this off season, I'm going to figure out how to hit the high heater. It's like, How? You're going to spend the whole offseason hitting off high flips and a high machine. Like, it's still not – you don't get the game reps. I always – and, like, after that, I kind of started to feel like, all right, I can, I can work on some little things. I can do mental cues. But until spring training, like, I'm not really going to know where I am or what it feels like. Well, I think one thing that, you know, talking to some of the young kids yesterday too is I can tell you all day long that you need to do X, Y, and Z. But if you don't believe it, then it's not going to work. And so the more that you can find something that you believe in, that you're convicted in, and that you feel that you can kind of believe in for the whole season. And that's the crazy part about that is that changes. Yeah. Right? And Sometimes week to week. One year you, might, you may think one thing, and it works beautifully. The next year you think that same thing and it doesn't work anymore. So you've got to really find something you believe in. And I feel like once you find that, then you create the routine and process and say from February 7th is when I'm getting to AZ till, you know, hopefully November 2nd when the last out of the World Series is, I'm going to do this and this is going to work for me and this is going to give me my best chance to be successful over 700 at-bats. Yeah, and you make like little adaptations in the season when you feel something, but 
I, I think we said this to the kids the other day too, is like the biggest issue or, or the, the worst thing you can do to yourself is like it's May 5th and you're like, panic, panic, I got to change something. Or, or I mean, right. so many people, they do this drill, this drill, this drill all off season and then they start like 0 for 7 in spring training and it's like, yeah, gone. <laughs> I mean, I, I started out one for 30 in spring last year. I was about ready to hit left hand. That was pretty I mean, good, I was, Coach. I mean, y'all, y'all did, I joke did your about first, that all the time. Your, your, your homer you hit at the end of spring training, that feels significant at the time? Even though oh, my gosh. I thought I, I thought I saved my career, honestly. <laughs> and then, But then you had the, the best possible start you could have. To yeah, I know. It was like, like this, and it just makes you go. It's hmm. the stupidest sport. I want to suck every spring training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't need, it doesn't need to be good in spring. Yeah, spring and it's crazy when you start thinking, like, spring doesn't really matter. And I'm not saying that you don't care. You're not trying to get into a certain groove, but... I've hit 400 in spring training and hit, you know, 230 in a season. Then I've hit, Dude, yeah. you know, 040 and I've hit well in a season. So it doesn't, it has no, you know, bearing on what's actually going to happen during the season. In 18, I had the best spring you could possibly have, just launching all over the place. <laughs> Homer to start the season, first pitch, gah! Next month was just a disaster. It was <laughs> just like, where am it's I? It's crazy. Yeah, I do. I joke about hitting left-handed. I do hit left-handed a lot, though. In like the pre game, yeah, I hit left-handed a lot before the game. It just kind of makes me feel like a kid again, and like bring some more or less bring some joy back because no one's ever coached my left-handed swing. There's no so drills, and that's it's so that's natural. You know what I mean? I'm like, man, I wish I could hit right-handed like this. You know, but that's why Nico swings harder left-handed. Yeah, got to move both ways. It's just you don't man. even think about it. <laughs> You're yeah. like, whoop. All right, fellas. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for hanging out. That is Dansby and Nico Compound Live. Thank, Thank you, back. guys. Thank you, fellas. That was Nico Horner and Dansby Swanson. It's awesome to talk. A little middle infield, a little playing in Chicago, a little bit of Dansby's outfits with the cowboy hat, and then come the next day in the Jays. Fun to sit down with those guys and check in on their offseason. That was brought to you by... Bruce Bolt, my favorite batting gloves, your favorite batting gloves, Bruce Bolt. Dot US. I have a pair of baby blues, a pair of whites with baby blue, the HAP series. Zach is going to be wearing Bruce Bolts this year. Super excited about that. It's time to get your baseball pants for the season. They got all different kinds. They got the long, they got the shorties, they got the baseball shorts. Bruce Bolt. Dot US to check that out today. Let's go to Advert and Justin Steele. Back end, our closer and Cy Young finalist, Justin Steele. Good conversation about their offseason, their fishing trip, Steele's wedding, and everything about starting and relieving. Dansby's great hair gets out of here. Boys, how are we? Fantastic. Having a good Cubs con so far, running around? Well, you, you just had an autograph session. I did. I did. It was good. What did you have this morning? Anything? Uh, I was doing some podcasts this morning. Oh. A little podcast? Yes. <laughs> back to back, huh? Back to back. <laughs> um, as we're getting settled here, you know what I want to start with? I heard Demp talked about the fishing trip last night. So I don't want to, like, talk about the fishing trip. I just heard about the fishing trip. But we'll start, we'll start serious. Maybe we'll back off. But I want to talk about bullpen starting. You guys come up together, right? Yeah, we did. You came up both as starters, and then you get to the big leagues. Albert, you started first. Yes. And then you were with bullpen. Out first. of the bullpen. I want to say I came, at, came after him a few times as well. Yeah, and you guys piggybacked a couple of times. So, like, yep. talk about that experience. Talk about how the bullpen helped you in your starting role once you got that, and then talk about how starting pitching and then going to the bullpen and how that – that changed your perspective. You, you can go first. You got uh, there first and everything. I mean, just just being from I started to to being a, a reliever, like it just it changed a lot. Cause in the good way to me, I feel like it just helped me to simplify my stuff, simplify my pitches, and then just go out there and, and just attack the hitter uh, with my best stuff right away. And like, you, did you feel like you could let it eat? Yes, like from pitch absolutely. One, like you didn't yes. have to save anything. Um, but another thing that I kept from being a starter is like I still keeping that mentality of feeling the strike zone, you know, like yeah, yeah, working yeah. backdoor pitches, hip chops, all, all, all that kind of stuff. It's not just like go on there and, and, and throw the baseball. It's just like 
having the notion of what you're doing out there as well. Because you come up as a starter, you still have to throw 70, 80 pitches. You still have to get through five, six, seven innings. Yep. And so you do. You fill up the strike zone. That's your mentality. And then when you can take that to a bullpen roll where you're, you're letting it eat and you're still living in the strike zone, like both those things together, that's what's made yep. you I mean, really successful. When you have guys in the middle of the infield like Dansby and Nico, like <laughs> you, you just let your staff play. Yeah, just right put, it, put it in play. They got it. <laughs> please, please hit it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cecilia, tell me, from, from your perspective, so you, you come up, they put you in the bullpen role, you're kind of doing the multi-inning thing uh, out of the pen, and then, like, what did you learn from that, and, like, how did you take that into... Yeah, so uh, 2020 happened, and uh, there was no minor leagues, pretty much. Y'all were working at the big league level and stuff, and they had me at the alt site, and uh, I was kind of getting big, big league reps in, you know, getting that kind of work in. I was coming out of the bullpen because they were going to use me that year. I was going to be out of the bullpen in 2020. So for me, that kind of just helped me. I was getting the big league reps. That was much needed for me. I was adding the slider at the time. That helped out a lot. And then for me, just coming out of the bullpen and knowing, like, I just need to get three outs here, that kind of changed my perspective on starting a little bit because if you – can break it down it's like i can just relieve for six straight innings <laughs> yeah yeah just get three out six times yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it kind of just changed the way i thought about it a little bit instead of looking at it as a like seven inning massive thing just one inning at a time break it down like that hey, well isn't that like a lesson on process like you think about process and like when we when we start the season i got asked the other day like what are your goals for the season like <laughs> what, do, what do you think i'm mean, like gonna write down like I want to hit 100 homers this year. Like, yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> but, like, it, it, it's every single day. And, like, in this game, you can get so far ahead of yourself. You know, you can get so far down the road. And I've done it in my career. You know, when it gets close to the All-Star game or when it gets close to something where you're like, God, I really want that. And you can get so far into the future. And, like, being super processed, like, one day at a time, like, that's, that's even more micro of, like, instead of getting through seven today, I'm going to get through the first three guys, and then we're going to do it again, and then we're going to do it again, yeah. and then we're going to do it again. Exactly. And it just that changes your outlook on, like, how this thing goes. Because, and the same thing, like, out of the bullpen. It's like, yeah, man, everyone wants to save 50 games. Everybody wants to. But, like, it really is about, like, today when I go and do my early work, like, I'm going to do that right, and I'm going to do my process right. So talk to me about the difference, like, physically. Like, now how do you work out out of the bullpen? Because, like, you don't know when you're going to throw. You don't know if it's going to be back-to-back. It's going to be three in a row. If you're going to be down for two, because it's all depending on what what the boys do. So, like, how, how have your workouts changed on like what days you work out? How uh, do you do it? I just try to just not throw too much. To be honest, I'm like, I know at this point what it takes me to be ready to go out and, and, and pitch late in the game. So, like, I just try to keep my arm as fresh as I can. Like, I know that I don't need to go out there and play catch 200 feet every single day and make 60 throws every single day before the game like it's not going to take me nowhere during the season and you you work out after every appearance As, yeah i work out right after the game all the time yeah it's, i go into stretch out after the game like i'm gonna roll i'm gonna roll out i'm gonna move around a little bit adverts like deadlifting 400 pounds <laughs> <laughs> take it easy man take it easy. <laughs> Hey, it's, it's the, the days he gets up in the bullpen but doesn't get in the game, so he's hot and ready. Uh, so he just goes to the gym and just gets after it. Yeah. Hot to. We have, like, down the stairs at Wrigley, we have, like, our locker room. Then you walk down a hall, and there's big windows uh, in front of the weight room. And you have to get to the food room. <laughs> you just, like, walk down. And you're, like, looking in the window, like, oh, my God. You guys are working in there. Yeah. It's crazy in there. Um, so you guys are both in AZ in the off season. Yeah. I've been going to the facility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How's the facility doing these days? How's everybody? It's doing good. I'm taking care of it, doing what I can down there. Yeah. Playing catch, working out. A lot of, a lot of the boys are down there now. JMO's down there. Yeah. yeah. Everybody will start showing up in, in the next couple of weeks. We've got Keegan Claus, dynamic duo down there. Yes. Uh, what's the big focus, Ben, for the offseason for you guys? Just I know you, I mean, you've got a lot going on. Yeah, I've had a lot going on. Got Congrat- married. Congratulations. And, uh, had a lot going on. Thank you all. Thank you all. But um, for me, as far as baseball goes, I was kind of doing the same thing I did last year, just sticking to the process, remaining consistent. Something you were speaking on earlier is, you know, writing down goals and stuff. I think that's kind of stuff's really important. But the other side of it, I think it's more important, like, to set goals for your process and how you go about things rather than, like you were saying, like, write down 100 homers or 200 strikeouts. Like, yeah, it's cool to achieve those things, but 
I think it's more important to do the process that gets you there. And then when it happens, it just happens. Yeah, and, like, when you can hold yourself accountable to the way that you work every day, like, every, like if it's something that gets you ready, if it's doing your arm care, if it's doing your, you know, some, like, during the season, there's so much stuff that goes on. Like, it's easy to forget to, like, get body work done. Mm-hmm. Like, it's easy to be, like, our massage therapist, Big Rub, the best in the game. You'll be like, hey, man, I, like, you said you wanted to come in. Be like, I got running around in circles. We got a 120 game. And, like, I'm like, come find me and tackle me. Like, do not let me like, have to do this. <laughs> and, like, those things, like, just holding yourself accountable to, like, I'm going to get all these things in between the four days of my start. Mm-hmm. Like, when you can hold yourself accountable to that, like, that's what lets you make 32 starts. Exactly. It gives you a chance to actually do those things you want to do, right? So what about, Albert, what's your, what's your offseason look like? Same? Uh, pretty similar? I'm, I've been down in Arizona pretty much most of the time with this guy right here. I just feel the, the same thing we did last year, like, right after the season. We just look at each other and we're like, well, when something is working, you don't need to change it, right? Well, so. got to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so it's so easy. I think like you guys are both at the point in your career, right, where you've you've been through a bunch of off seasons. You've tried a bunch of different stuff and like learned from it. And then when you get to that point of like, all right, wait a minute, this like I don't have to do something crazy. Yep. Like, that's what I. That's the experience I've had the last few years. Is like, there's little things that I want to do. Like there's little things that I want to get better at and try, but like not at the expense of like. <laughs> yard sailing a whole off season mm-hmm. track because I want to stay healthy and I want to do the things that have kept me on the field and kept me consistent. Like that's the most important part. It takes me back to my first few spring trainings and I would go home and I'd work out in Baton Rouge and there was yeah. like football players training for the NFL combine, like all kinds of stuff going on. And I'm trying to run sprints with them, work out with them and stuff like that. And as I got later into my career, I started learning like, I don't need to do all that. Like I just need to be able to throw strikes Fill the zone up, last a uh, hundred and sixty-two, and I think that transition helped me out a lot. Yeah, I, I, we've, I think we've watched so many guys that come in, and you know, you get guys that come in like he had a really good year, and he was like one hundred and fifty pounds or one hundred and seventy-five pounds, and then it's like you know, bulk up, like minor league guy, like you got bulk him up, and the guy gets like two hundred and twenty pounds, and it's like, oh my god. I can't even move. <laughs> <laughs> Stiff as a board. Yeah. And it's just like so much of that. We had, we had this amazing teammate in, uh, in the minor leagues. I think we all play with him. Jeffrey Baez. Yeah. Jeffrey Baez. Jeffrey Baez. Oh, my God. <laughs> was a right fielder for the Cubs in the minor leagues. Might have weighed 250 pounds. Ran like a deer. <laughs> like a gazelle. This dude would steal 30 bags every year. 250, 30 bags every year. And they were like, you got to gotta slim down, man. Like it's too, and I'm like, don't touch that guy. He's, <laughs> he's unbelievable. He's stealing 30 bags every year. It's like the Latin Mark Zagunas almost. Mark yeah. Zagunas was kind of like Yeah, that. yeah. Except Mark was like, like ripped. Rich. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, I mean, Jeffrey had like the, he had like kind of the stomach and then the six pack that sat on top of the stomach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Talk to, talk to me about the minor league days. Like, how, how many years did you guys actually play together? I knew you overlapped a lot, but was, was, did you come up consistently together, or was it like you would kind up of... Up until high A. Up, until, up high. until high A, so three or four years. And then I had Tommy John. He continued on, double A, triple A, ended up making his debut. I took, like, nine to ten months with TJ, came back the following year, double A, triple A, and then I kind of caught back up. Yeah, so that was... That, what was that year that you guys were in Eugene? 2015. Because we were together in yeah. 15. You were there yeah. for two weeks. I was there too. And we, so we were all there yeah. together in 15, and then it was kind of like watching you. And then we did, we did Instructs that next year. Mm-hmm. So that would have been the off-season of 15, which was hilarious. And you're staying in the hotel, and you're doing Instructs, and then you have, you have like – these guys had been in the organization for a while – so, like, they had a group of friends and, like, guys that they had been in AZ with and come up together, and they all go to <laughs> Eugene together. I, like, just got drafted, like, a month before. And I'm like, I don't know anybody. I spent, um, I spent a month in, in Eugene and then a month in South Bend. <laughs> I come into Instructs, and I'm, like, trying to get to know guys. Like, who's this guy? Who's that guy? And then we had a, uh, a talent show. Oh, yeah. Remember the talent I show? Remember, I remember the talent show. The talent show. The talent show. I remember it. <laughs> yeah. So the Cubs would make you, like, in groups of four, do a talent show in Instructs, and so you'd have to come up with something. And uh, Carson Sands, 
Who was the, the, the drop down righty that we played with in Eugene who was great? Um, Hoff, Hoff, Hoffman. 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 Uh, I can't remember his first Corbin. Name. Corbin. Corbin Hoffman. Corbin Hoffman. Unbelievable. And so we had this group of like four dudes and we did a, oh, we did a dance to like Britney Spears or something. <laughs> Un- unbelievable. So great. I still have, I think I still have some videos somewhere of us practicing in the hotel room. <laughs> And now, now, do the kids stay, like, right across the street now? I know a lot of guys get apartments or something right across the street. Yeah, like give it's them funny, I've been in Arizona the whole offseason now, and I feel like I never see them running camps anymore. And when I was coming up, I was at every single camp. Yeah, there was a hundred camps. November camp, and now it's like I'm there by myself. And it's like, I don't even have to be here, but I'm here. Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the, the November, it was Instructs, November camp, and then a strength camp, right? Mm-hmm. And then January camp, <laughs> mini camp. <laughs> and, the, yeah, and then right into spring training, and you're like, oh, my God, I didn't have an off-season. Well, Nico and I were talking about it because we talked to the prospects, and they, last year, they, had, they, were, they were there all off-season. They had, like, a full off-season of stuff, and I think they backed it off this year just to give them some time to recover. Mm-hmm. It was, it was kind of great, though, because you get to the facility, it's just quiet, Hang and me, kicks and Clausen, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the best, right? That's why in spring, that's why I show up so early so I can get it done by your, like the solo when you get to put your own music on and roll. Like that's the best. And when you guys are in the facility, everybody should get out of the way, and you guys should be able to do that anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is really nice go ahead and being out there, having your routine set and everything, because. In years past, where I was doing everything at home, and then I would just show up to spring training, and it would be like a whirlwind. Like, I wouldn't know where I'm supposed to be and all that stuff. So it's nice to go ahead and be out there and have everything set. Yeah, I'm excited to get out there and get back in the routine. Um, what else should we talk about, boys? Do you want to talk about the wedding? Yeah, what you got? I'm sorry I missed the wedding. No, that's okay. I understand a busy schedule. I, I really wanted to be there. The it was pretty. We had uh, we had Longhorns, Longhorns in the back. I love Some Longhorns. Three Lakes, beautiful house, great venue, family, friends. The wife was happy. That was the most important. That's the most important thing. Most important. Is it just an amazing. amazing this guy day. can shoot skeets. Really good skeet shooter. You got that in the bag? You know, I always. He didn't know he had it in the bag. He's got it in the bag. <laughs> Where'd you learn that? You know I always deliver. <laughs> <laughs> so, you go. It was it was in New Orleans, just outside of New Orleans. Yeah, everybody was flying into New Orleans. We uh, rented out Three Rivers Ranch, and it's like a duck hunting, pheasant hunting, skeet shooting, hangout thing. And so we had her family, my family, Abbott was there. We were sk- sk- shooting skeets and just hanging out, having a good time. It was a lot of fun. And that was. Where'd you go? Thursday to Sunday? Really? Yeah, Thursday to Sunday. That's so awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I did the, we did the, um, if anybody's getting married in the future, what we did, which was an interesting strategy, is we went Thursday rehearsal, welcome party thing, Friday off, mm. day of rest. Hey, you got a day off in between. Yeah, day off. <laughs> yeah. Got to build in the day off. And then, I want to know how that rehearsal going then. Yeah. <laughs> Thursday night was a blast. And then Friday day off, Saturday wedding. That was a Danny Mueller special. The Mueller family uh, taught us that one. So if anybody's getting married, I highly recommend the day off. <laughs> it looked beautiful. Sorry I missed it. No, yeah. Thank you. I know. It was, it's a busy office. It's like you send out the invites to the boys. And you're like, hey, I'm doing a good wedding. And it's like, well, you forget that, like, we all plan, like, vacations for right after the World Series. So, like, if you're getting married in the, like, month after World Series, like, everybody's going somewhere, mm-hmm. doing something. It's like, dude, I've been planning this vacation for the last seven months because this is the first time I've been able to get off. And so, like, you send out the invites, you get back, like, I'm going to be in Italy. I'm going to be in Mexico. I'm going to be here. It's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. That's what I would be doing, too. That was the same thing with the, uh, the wedding and the fishing trip. This, this coming in this off season. same thing. Everybody's just planning their trips and everything, so... Anybody that can show up, it's always just fun and nice to do. Yeah, the fishing trip. So you, That's going to be a yearly thing. It's going to be sick. You guys are, yeah. But you had, like, all time. like. Yeah, I mean, I've never caught tuna that big. Oh. It, was, it was unbelievable. It was, it was Meat in the freezer for a year and a half at least. Can we, are you going to bring some for the boys? Yeah. Some, some Chicago? I think he's got his in Arizona right now. I had some tuna steaks three nights ago back home. 
Fantastic. Delicious. Yeah. Dude. And then, I mean, the videos were, were oh, crazy. Oh, and then I think Nick came back. Nico came back here right after and was telling me about it and showing me videos and stuff. Oh, it's dude, just it's, like insane. It's hard to put into words the kind of experience that is. It's just something you got to get out there and kind of do. Stay on a houseboat on the water, watch football, and then wake up at 5 in the morning, get oh. fish all day. It's electric. Who was like the number one wrangler? Like who, was, who spent the most time reeling? Because don't, don't you have to... You're like kind of trading off. So this trip was different because we were having to race the sharks getting the fish into the boat. Yeah, the fish. So these are 130, 140 pound tuna, and they're hard to get in, and there's a shark usually chasing it, trying to eat it. Yep. So imagine the, <laughs> imagine the 100, 150 pound tuna or whatever, and there's a tiger shark three times its size right behind it trying to bite it. So you, we're panicking. I can't, I can't imagine that. We're pan- <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah, It's hard to put into words. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, so we're, like, racing to get this fish out of the water so the shark doesn't eat oh it. Oh, my God. But, and there's, like, ten boats out there, and they're all, everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's just trying not to get their yep. fish eaten by a shark. When yep. we pulled up and we're weighing our fish, this guy pulls up with what would have been, like, a 200-pound tuna and half of it's missing. Half, half of the two that was busy. <laughs> yep. Because the shark just said, I'm yeah. having lunch. Yeah. Die. Well, the sharks, no. The sharks are like, we can get free food here. Like, we're going to sit right here. We don't have to run too fast or swim too fast. It's easy for them. It's a pain, though. It's a pain dealing with them. And then, and then you got me on the other side, like, just looking around and being like, you see all these sharks just going around the boat? And I'm like, you're trying me to pull this fish that is 150 pounds? Like, he's, like, 300 feet deep. <laughs> I, listen, you're going to go, you're getting I out I really there. wanted to come on this trip. You're getting out there. I'm pretty scared now. <laughs> it might be me in the middle of the boat, like, just, <laughs> not going to die today. That was the only reason why I didn't sleep the night before. I was just thinking about the sharks. Oh, <laughs> no, cell, no cell service either. That's the best, yeah, yeah, that's the best right. part. Yeah, if you fall in, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, fellas. Thank you. We're going to have Benny Pro coming on next. Justin Steele. Thank you all. And Albert Alize. It's great talking to Steely and Albert. So cool to hear about how they've used their starting and relieving roles to form who they are today. That was brought to you by SeatGeek. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. More than 70,000 events every single day on SeatGeek, including sports, concerts, festivals, and more. They always want to make sure you're getting a great deal. So look for the green dot. Green means good. Red means bad. Green dots only. We've got the hookup for you. Use code COMPOUND for $20 off your first purchase at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase at SeatGeek with promo code COMPOUND. Look for that green dot. 2016 World Series MVP Ben Zobris joins us next teammate of mine and a mentor here is benny so 2016 world series mvp ben zobel hey buddy hi it's good to see you you too thanks for doing this nothing like hopping off a plane and just giving you a hug you know did you fly in this morning yeah did you so you were here and then you flew back and then you came back earlier this week yeah because yes that's so gracious. I had to go back and connect, take care of some things in Nashville. Yeah. So I'm like, I got to be here for this, right? Oh, I mean, you have to. Yeah. And you got the ring on. God, look at that thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> flashing a little bling yeah. today. You know who else is rocking that around? John Maley's walking around with the. Is he? Yeah, with the. I didn't know ring. this. Yeah. I want to. I want to see him too. You gotta find, yeah, you got to find Mails. You know, Mails is back. What's that? Mills is back. What's he doing? He's our. I didn't know this. He's our assistant hitting coach. Is he? Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited for that. I know. I say it. So am I. Man, it's amazing. Like, I probably should have known that information well, before okay. I walked on stage. It's all right. I'm breaking news. Breaking news. No, thank yeah. you. So, John, I, John Maley was my first hitting coach in the big leagues in 2017. He was uh, 15, 16, 17. Yeah. Um, so, you had him 16, 17. And uh, and he was in AAA with us last year as AAA hitting coach. And now he's back as the assistant. So I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to him back. Yeah. And he's a Chicago guy. I yeah, mean, he loves it. Right here, man. Yeah, he would. He might be out there if he wasn't yeah. back there. He probably would be. Yeah. Ben, 
we, we've heard a lot this offseason about the free agent process. We've got guys signing. You went through that, and you chose Chicago. Yes, I did. <laughs> Can, hold on, hold on. Before we get to that, I don't want to mean to hijack this interview. No, please. This podcast. It's just you and I. But I went to your coffee shop earlier this week. We need to yeah. talk about this. Oh, yeah. Um, you weren't there. I, no, I was not. I wasn't on, it wasn't my shift. But this is even better. I didn't realize, like, I was going to be doing this with you on Saturday. Yeah. So, so this makes up for it. But, you know, out of, the, out of the deal, I got a coffee mug that says that you make me coffee. So yeah, are you, you making me some coffee today? Or yes. Something? Uh, well, I'm right after this, I'm doing the Connect meet and greet. So we'll just walk down there. And uh, get perfect. Two perfect. Yeah. I, think that, I think they might be, like, right out there where there's I'm, I'm into that because I'm, I, I really like my Connect Roasters drink. No, they do a great job. The yeah, coffee, it was a, it was a vanilla latte, but don't judge me because I know well, you're. Yeah, you're very. I made my own pour over this morning, but hey, <laughs> you did. Yeah, yeah, it's this right here. I'm sure. And you then did. we have the we have the cold brew too. Are you cold brew guy? Cold brew. Yeah, I I don't do that very much. Uh, I've done it when I'm desperate for caffeine, and th- that's the only time. But yeah, well, I'm glad you were able to go down and see it because it's right across the, the street from. Olivia Nazarene, right? Yeah, Olivet. Yep, all that of was that. one of my... Uh, oh, we got some Olivetians <laughs> in here, apparently. It was one of my uh, alma maters yep. and played baseball down there for three years. Traveled Chicago Collegiate, which is what made it so special. They were actually the educational partner of the Cubs back in 2017 after we won. <laughs> it was just so amazing. It was amazing. It was all over the stadium for that year. So, But it's so cool. Like when you and Caleb, who was my former teammate at Olivet teamed up because Caleb got into the coffee business and you guys teamed up and I found out I was like no way two of yeah, my yeah, former yeah. teammates yeah like I have to try this and, coffee and, yeah and, and he's the best and so if you're down in Bourbon A if you want to make the trip Connect Rose is down there in Bourbon A the shop is is really cool it's it is a cool shop it, you it, guys did it, they did, did a great job. job with it yeah it's got a really great atmosphere anyways we can get back to your you interview want, okay. <laughs> well tell me about you so 15 you win the world series yeah. And then you become a free agent. You don't have to take me through the whole process, but just take me through, like, what, what was intriguing about the Cubs and then, like, the city of Chicago and how, how you end up making that decision. Yeah, well, I mean, Chicago is, like, obviously one of the best cities in the country. And anytime you visit here, yes, yes, it's amazing. Uh, you know, anytime you visit here, especially in the summer, which is a beautiful time of year, uh, uh, it's as a visiting player, you're like, wow, this is so cool. Like, and you know, you have the Cubs and the White Sox and you're just like, it's just this really cool, uh, history of baseball in this city as well. How how many times had you played in Chicago? I mean, you played the White Sox, but how many times had you played at Wrigley? Because you were AL the Not many times. Yeah. A couple times. So the first time, believe it or not, I grew up in central Illinois, like two hours south of this But the first time I ever went to Wrigley Field, this was a mistake, I admit. First time I ever did that was as a visiting player in 2011 with the Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah. And we came up on this this field out of the neighborhood. And I was like, what is happening right (laughs) now? Where am I? I was like, this is so cool. You go from like row houses to like, boom, there's the stadium. And then we walked in, and I was just like, there is no place like this in baseball. Yeah. No place like it. It's really, really special. Yeah. I think I decided then that, like, if if that was an option in free agency, I was like, this is a serious option. Yeah. Yeah. And especially coming off what the team did in 15 and, like, that momentum was probably, like, you know, be a part of that. It was a huge part. Yeah. As a free agent, of course, you're looking for, like, okay, you, you want a good mix of young guys. You're getting to a veteran stage of your career. You know, I was like in the latter parts of my career, and you're going, yeah, you don't want to just go somewhere and, and have a tough time for the next three, four years. You want to win. So you want to go a place where there's young guys, but they're, they're kind of right there on the cusp. Yeah. You know, and maybe I can be one of those pieces that helps push it over the edge. And thankfully, I mean, that year, too, was amazing because they were going out and, uh, you know, there were several other guys that were signing on the heels of John Lester coming here. Right. And it was just a really neat uh, time to where when we got to spring training that year, it was like everybody had it, the target was on our back, as Joe Madden as said. As Joe Madden said, yeah. yeah. When I, I remember in 16, 
It was my first camp, not big league camp, because there was no need for me over there. But I was, I was a young buck and doing the minor league camp, and I'm, I'm in the weight room on the other side of the weight room away from the big league players, and just kind of looking and seeing, like, Lester, Lackey, Arietta, Jay Hay, Chris Yu, Briz, and all of these big bodies. And just being like, <laughs> they're so big. Oh, my God. <laughs> like the biggest team ever everybody was six five there dude. was there was some big dudes on that team oh god you know I, i've had people tell me oh you're actually bigger than i thought you were and i'm like yeah it's yeah, because well, of that I everybody else is six yeah. five to six eight yeah if you if you've ever seen uh, lester and lackey together they're both houses they're massive <laughs> yeah that's true so but in that same spring i got called over you probably don't remember this you might no, I remember this. I got they it. asked me specifically. They said, hey, are you okay with this? Yeah. I was like, of course. Yeah, which is like... Who's the kid? Yeah, which is like the right thing to do. <laughs> so there was one day in spring uh, that they said, hey, we're going to have you go over to the big league camp and work out with the big league guys. And so I went over. Oh, oh my God. And I, uh, and, I, and I took ground balls with you at second base. Yeah, because I was an infielder then, and so we just talked. They kind of had—I I don't know what they told you, but it was kind of like go ask Ben about playing second, go ask him about second outfield, like pick his brain. And so we talked about infield, we talked about infield, outfield. But the one thing that like really, really stuck with me from that conversation was you asked me, you were like, "Do you walk?" And I was like, "Yeah, actually, Ben, I do walk. I have a good eye. I can do that." And you were like, "No, no, no. Like it's really hard to walk in the big leagues." And, like, getting to 3-2, like, winning those counts is, like, really tough. And that was one of the things that really stuck with me was, like, it is challenging to walk in the big leagues and, like, what an impact it has. Do you remember yeah. that? I don't remember that question specifically, but what I do remember, I'm glad I gave you that answer. Yeah, it sounds like It sounds like I knew what I was talking about at the time. <laughs> but I, what I remember is them talking to me and, and, and telling me, hey, this, is, this kid is this this kid we drafted and they're telling me your name and they're going like, Hey, he's, he's got some real potential. Like, and they, they also remarked that you were, and I don't know if this is true or not. You were remarkably mature for your age. Is that true? Did you feel that way about me, Ben? I mean, I, I you know, uh, to be honest in the conversation that we had, I was like, this kid's going to be a big leaguer. Like I knew it because of your mindset. I could see it in your eyes. I could see it in the way that you took, you know, your, your work seriously and the conversations that we had and you were cerebral and you, you know, you weren't just like, you know, there wasn't anything you were wowed at either. You were just like, this is, but you were respectful. You know, I think that's the thing as a young player you, you want to see is you want to see a guy that's confident and he knows who he is. He knows what kind of player he is, but he's also a little open and respectful to guys that are older. That's kind of the biggest thing, right? Is like when, when, Everybody works, not everybody works hard, but a lot of guys work hard, right? You've got to work hard to get here. You, you guys, can't get to that level yeah, without that. You can't that. get there without, like, having some, some work ethic. Sure. But, like, when the guys come in and they, like, ask questions and they have a ton of respect for the dudes that have done it before them and, like, been through it, that's, kind of, that's when, as a veteran player, you're like, yeah, I mean, whatever, I'll, exactly. I want you to help want you. want to help a guy yeah. that has that mindset. Yeah. And, you, yeah, you, you were already there. And how old were you at the time in 16? 21. Yeah, that's, I mean, when you got a 21-year-old kid that, like, is already as, uh, you know, like, high prospect as, as, you know, you had done things in your minor league or amateur career up to that point, you know, and you see that kind of mindset, you're like, he's, he's going he's gonna to move quickly. And sure enough, it was only was one like, year yeah. later yeah. that you were up in the big leagues. I set up that question so Ben could say nice things about me. Um, <laughs> The other, well, the other thing we talked about a lot once I got caught up, you know, and we got to play together was that in, the infield outfield. Uh-huh. And we ended up, which is crazy, is like we ended up platooning to get, not like you played every day, I bounced around, but like we were playing the same spots and doing the same things with a relatively similar skill set at the time, you know, as far as the defense would go. And you were so generous to me to like help me through it. You know, you helped me through all those things. You helped me through playing second, going to the outfield, what it took to get the work done. Where, like, 
you were you you were guaranteed. You didn't have to do that. You know, like you didn't have. You could have been like, yeah, figure it out, kid. But like, you really helped me through that stuff. Well, it helped that we had had so much success the last couple of years, right? Because I think for some guys, it can be if you're not at free agency yet, you haven't gotten your contract, and you haven't won yet. It could there could be some like piece of you that's just like ah, angry at anybody that's getting in your way. But at that point, I was like, no, we need whatever Ian's got to bring to the table. We, we got to have it in order for this team to succeed. And if that means I take a lesser role, Ian takes a greater role, or whatever it meant the last few years of my career, I was like, I, I wanted that for the team. But I also wanted it for you knowing like, okay, you're going you're gonna to have a better chance if I'm not creating a tension there. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because you, you want less tension when you're playing. You want to feel free. Like, hey, go out there and crush it, bro. Right? And, and so that's hard to find on a team, though, to be honest. Like, it's it's hard, really hard. It's hard to have very little tension between teammates. I mean, you've got a lot of guys on the team, and everybody's at different points in their career. But you have to have – to have that kind of relationship with younger guys, you have to be kind of past a certain point sometimes. Or you have to – like, dude, you were just, like, the most pro, like, open, greatest teammate. Like, you are – an exceptional, exceptional teammate. And like, well, that is why. And I'm glad you followed the script on that because. <laughs> Come on. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, it, it's dramatically different when a young guy has the mindset that you have. Like, you're like, hey, you tell, tell me, is there anything I could be doing different or better here? Like, you're open to being challenged, critiqued, yeah. and growing in, in new ways. But also knowing you're different, right? You're not just, like, going to model whatever somebody else did. Like, you got to do it your own way. Can we do this again on my podcast because they're in my ear telling me we got to rap? Wait, what? Can we do this again, like, another full podcast? Because I yeah, can talk to you I, for hey, another hour. I'm down if you come on my podcast. Okay. Yes. Yes. Trade podcast. Ben Zobrist. Okay. It was Benny Zo finishing out the compound live. He is the best. We're definitely going to have to have him on for a full hour because I could pick his brain all day. He is an absolute beauty. 2016 World Series MVP. That was the compound live. I had a blast doing it. Do it again next year. Maybe, maybe a couple more times. I think we could let us know, but I think that we could do something pretty cool filling up a venue in Chicago. Let's do the Sloan screen time for the people. Sloan is the world's leading manufacturer of commercial plumbing systems. The company is at the forefront of the green building movement and provides smart, sustainable, and hygienic restroom solutions by manufacturing water efficient products, including flush meters, meters, faucet sink systems, soap dispensers, and fixtures for commercial, industrial, and institutional markets worldwide. To learn more, visit Sloan.com. The boys sent in their screen times. They were hilariously high. And I think it's because nobody, nobody knew. <laughs> Nobody had any idea no, we were doing this. No, nobody was protecting their screen times. I had 436. Tom, you had uh, 954. 954. This is true. This is, this is good because you get to see the honest screen times. We know well, when your Sunday recording. your Sunday bar is really high. Listen, we don't want to talk about what happened on Sunday. It's a scary Sunday bar. But that, like, you would think that 954 was bad. No, no, no. Zach had 730 and Dakota... Maybe an all-time high with eleven twenty-four. That is a crazy, crazy number. Eleven twenty-four from Dakota. Dakota's bar from about six o'clock on is pretty much just at the top for the rest of the I mean, night. It's sixty minutes. He's on his phone for literally four straight hours. Pretty much. He said no comment at this time. I can't wait to talk to him about that next week. Let's go. That day. is that is episode one ninety-two of the Compound Podcast, Compound Live, second annual, presented by Connect Roasters. Go to connectroasters.com, check out the Home Run Club, try the coffee, let us know what you think. We'll see you next week.